All right. So, hi, everybody. Um, I'm my name is Daniel Ediger, and I work in the same building as SART at the same organization at Northwest Justice Project. And um, uh, we've worked together for several years. And so I just did a image search on myself so you can see what I look like. There's the three that pop up. Um, so I am the, I do most of the videos on our YouTube channel in Washington Law Help, but I am also a staff attorney. So I have like a lot of people in legal services, more than one job to do. So that kind of informed my creation of this guide with limited time and money because I also have hundreds of clients every year. So how do, how do you uh, make videos when you have other constraints? Um, this is our YouTube channel. These are all the videos we've made over the years, or not all of them. This is about a third of the videos. And we've done lots of different kinds. We've experimented. And so I'd say the SART and Ket, you're on the, on the webinar as well. And I have a lot of experience with making videos with limited time and money. So just to repeat what SART said, please feel free to ask anything. Ask us anything. And <laughs> Um, we'll do our best to answer. So, um, this is, you know, Sart already showed you, but this is the, the video guide link, how to make and test videos with limited time and money. I tried to get this thing down to about 10 pages, and the intended audience, in my mind, was somebody who has never made a video or has made one, but just doesn't know if it was working at all. And really that first group of people like who, I don't know, maybe for various reasons intimidated or not sure how to, if they're even, if it's even possible, how, how to make a video. I wanted to boil it down into like, yes, you can and get you from like zero to, you have a video that's working in a few months. So that was kind of the intention of the guide. And I'm going to basically give a tour of the guide itself through this webinar. And you'll get to see each of the pieces and how I got to where, um, how, how I got to there. So when we started out a couple of years ago, wondering, like, you know, we had made various videos starting in 2011 when we got our YouTube channel. And a lot of people were asking, do you know if these videos work? Do, like, are, is anybody actually able to like solve their legal problem after watching them? I, I mean, a lot of people in the community, attorneys and other people were thinking like, well, they look great, but is this a waste of time? And, you know, we, we had anecdotal evidence that people liked them. We could see statistics through YouTube analytics, but you know, we hadn't ever really done a formal, gone out and asked, well, do they work? And ask people in the community, specifically our client communities, what they thought of them, what they thought of videos in general. So that was the field testing project that we put together in a TIG application. We've been, and we, over the next, over the two years after we got the grant, we conducted several field testing um, sessions to find out. This guide, which I just think anybody who's interested in making videos or publications of any kind, print, or, or just making any sort of legal information publication, should this be your first stop to read. Legal Services Society of British Columbia, Reaching Your Readers, they kind of wrote the book on it, but it was written in 2007. So this is something that, like, there probably could be some update. We tried to do it through, the, through our guide and to be like a supplement or complement to this guide. Um, I did start talking to people at Legal, Aid, Legal Services Society of British Columbia to talk to them about how they came up with that guide, what their experiences were, and they had done some really interesting work with field testing with groups of people in the indige indigenous community, and actually with comic book artists to say like they had a more narrative type of video where they had like different outcomes, and then they showed different kinds of videos. 
at a storyboard level and asked people which is which is better which is more realistic which like affects you more which do you think like would be a better way to communicate like for example the uh foster care system or the child child custody process and so i just want to like show this website here so you can see um legal aid BC, bc has done a lot of interesting videos that they have field tested and asked people in the community and that's where they get their um our guide and so two quick things <clears throat> that reaching your readers guide um, i just dropped a link to that in the chat um, I also downloaded a copy of it and put it in the handout resources if people want to download that uh, 2007 guide. So oh, it nice. is very easy for people to grab right now. Okay. Thanks, sir. So uh, why make the videos? I mean, like people constantly come up to me, I think, in our organization and say like, you know, I think we really need a video on this. and it's always kind of interesting to talk to them about like, well, why, why a video and not just a print publication or join out and do an outreach like in person? Um, there's lots of different reasons. I think I tried to boil them down here into the four main ones. I'll, and I, this was confirmed through a lot of, the, of our field tests. A lot of people learn through visual and moving images rather than reading text, reading like five pages of like how to walk your way through a parenting plan. Seeing a video is something that a lot of people want and request and ask for. And these are people in our community. So um, another thing we learned when I was doing outreach events, like, and I mean, basically going to a senior center, giving information and doing a Q&A as an attorney, but also having the video there. Uh, most people that we asked said the video helps. It helps to like start out with it has the images and then have like a, an attorney afterwards to ask and answer questions. Um, of course, posting them online on our YouTube channel, it kind of counteracts the other videos that are out there, which is, just seems to be becoming more and more prevalent. Um, any of our legal issues that people search for on YouTube, for example, landlord tenant issues, you're going to hit get a lot of different videos, but almost all of them are from the landlord's perspective. So when we put our videos up there, we change those search results and we get get the information that people who are in our client communities need. And then of course it can also serve as a promotional or a directive to like your website or um, your other services at a legal services organization. Just boiling down this various steps to try to make it easy, almost like a little checklist of how to how to go from like, I've never made a video to like, now we have something. Um, these are the main steps that I think it takes. And the first one I'm, I want to emphasize is asking the community what kind of videos you actually need to make. And then of course, writing, creating the visual images, recording the audio, editing, doing the field test and then changing it based on feedback. So I'm gonna go through each of these uh, steps because each of them are addressed really quickly in our guide. So again, I think this is just uh, representative of my philosophy about what these whole informational videos are about. It, you know, if, if we just as lawyers come up with something that we think this is what people need to know, then that's great, but it's never going to be complete or completely accurate based on what people need to know unless we ask them. And so, you know, asking frontline service providers like hotline advocates, legal assistants, and lawyers who are in the walk in clinics, what are the questions that come up over and over? And how do you end up addressing it? Almost like what are these little speeches that you end up having to memorize and what do you kind of wish like if everybody if you could tell everybody in the state w about a certain landlord tenant issue what would it be a lot of these frontline service providers will have a couple ready answers and those are the things that like i'd say are like the 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 first places to go and 
make, start making your videos. Um, not everything works well. Not all legal processes like turn into like a good short video. Some are made to, are too complicated. Um, step by step guides are good. Showing what an actual document looks like and kind of pointing out places in the form. Those are good ones. And then common misconceptions um, that you could just try to debunk, try to get that other information out there, like don't withhold rent. If your landlord isn't making repairs, you have to do it this other way. Like that's just like a, a pretty good topic idea. So the script template that I have been using for the past few years is pretty simple. It's got three columns. It's got a time code. It's got a what you hear like a narration or voiceover and a what you see. And to break it down like this is, uh, like this is a big step for a lot of people who like, who, who've never made a video, have never really thought visually, and there may be an attorney and they're like, we need, to, you, you, we need a video on this to get this information out there. And if they try to come up with a script, usually it doesn't have that visual part. And just, Putting it in a spreadsheet column like this, I think, can do a lot to show the other attorneys or people who you're working with to write the script to show them, like, every single sentence has to have something on screen visually. And it's not, like, that's the whole point. So this three-column so spreadsheet. When you're talking about this, you might, you might want to explain a little bit what the videos kind of look like, because some of the, like, previous people's experiences with videos are kind of the lawyer talking um, at you. And, and I think we use a very different design of video that is much easier to update. Uh, but what do you mean when you say, like, have, a, have something on the screen up there um, if it's not a talking head? OK. So I, I, and that's probably the, the classic example is the like lawyer in front of a bookcase talking. And we right away when we first started making videos decided we didn't want to do that i'm going to talk a little bit more about that in just a few minutes but our we use a very simple animation and i'm going to try to walk through again like <laughs> how you're going to be able to do this but it, it's like a cartoon it's basically a glorified powerpoint presentation so you know if we're talking about a house then maybe there's an image of a house. If we're talking about a document, a document is sliding over to the person who needs the document. Um, this script template, I think, is just a way to like remind other people you're working with that we're creating something visual in the end. With with like, of course, and words are the narration. There might be text on screen, but just to like link the two um, right from the outset. Um, there's a script template included in the guide itself, just to kind of show you, like, here's how to make your own. It's really just a chart or a spreadsheet that you can make in a Word file. Um, and the next step is creating those visual images. So again, to make the absolute simplest, how do you get there if you've never made one before? I say use PowerPoint or Keynote, which is Apple's version. That's the one I use because it's just a little easier to create these these drawings for me. But I can I've made them in PowerPoint just as well. Um, whenever I talk about making visual images, I ha there's a lot of people who immediately have like taken themselves out of the ability to do that. Maybe like I don't know what there was a bad experience in middle school or something, but a lot of people think I can't draw. There's no way. Um, a lot of those people can draw, or you can find drawings places. You can have friends or family members make the drawings. They can be really simple and comic book like. You know, one step above stick figure is fine. I think. Um, Everybody's got a camera now in their pocket with their phone, and each of these can be turned into images. So just getting 12 of them down there really quickly, 12 images, like 
with the words. You're making a PowerPoint, basically, is how you can start out thinking about it and getting them, you know, you're going to hold the slide on screen for five seconds each. And this is the start of making a video. So once you get these images, you export them into, the, into a file that can be um, put into your video editing software later. Um, looks like there's a question, where is he getting his images and video from? Is there, are there copyright issues? Um, so the way I avoid that is making original images. Again, this is like um, just drawing in a whiteboard, right? Taking a picture of it with your phone. Then it, in PowerPoint, using that, that image, the, like to add color and animation later, and then there's no copyright issue because you've created it. Um, sorry, you, you, you probably know um, what more screens with like copyright issue, because I just like avoid it by never finding images um, online. So like this image here dropped. that you're seeing of this phone and hand, that's something, that's my hand and phone. Okay, so I just dropped a link to a guide that we wrote um, a few years ago on copyright and creative commons for legal services. Um, it's about a 20 page guide, uh, but in there, uh, we also have a video that kind of explains the basics, um, but there's a bunch of links. Um, Pixel Bay is one of them. Um, also, if you go to a Google search, um, inside of Google search for images, um, there's a bunch of filters. And one of those filters, um, let me see, get the exact wording here, uh, but it allows you to search by the um, license that is associated with anything. Um, so if you go to Google, type in cats, go to the image search, um, there is a drop down which is called, um, let me, tools. And under tools, there's one called usage rights. And if you, it starts at unfiltered, but if you go to labeled for reuse with modification, 99% um, of those images are going to have an open copyright license on them to where anyone can use them. Uh, they'll be from several different sites, but uh, Pixel Bay, Flickr, uh, lots of different, um, there's one called uh, Plex, P-E-X-E-L-S. Um, and if you click on the individual image, it will usually take you to a page that has the license. So um, including public domain licenses or licenses where you just have to give someone credit. Um, creativecommons.org also has a search function that lets you search for music, video, images, lots of those things. Um, additionally, somebody asked they were getting an error for sharelawvideo.com. Um, it's actually sharelawvideo.org. Um, I dropped the URL into the chat, um, but the guides are up there. Additionally, any of the stock footage or um, guides, anything that is on that particular site um, is licensed in an open way that other legal services organizations can use it. Um, we also got a great um, comment from, I think it was uh, Zini here that has a few other sites where you can get images. So there's lots of places that have this openly licensed stuff, um, which can be public domain where you don't need any accreditation or something like a Creative Commons buy, where as long as you give the author credit, you can use it. Highly recommend using those and checking out the copyright guide. Yeah, see, thanks, Sart. Uh, so um, I even created like this video clip fun pack in the guide itself. Just, you know, if you download it as a PDF and you're looking at it on your computer screen, and you know how to take a screenshot or screen grab, you can take these images here that I've created, put them into your PowerPoint, and use them as much as you want. I mean, this is just a starter pack. I don't know if anybody is, it, I, I thought it was an interesting idea that somebody could use like any of these any way they wanted. That's, you know, courtroom, house, car. A lot of these things come up a lot in, our, in the legal issues that we were talking about. So there's another free resource.
And um, all these drawings were done like on a whiteboard, and then I colored them in PowerPoint. So uh, this is like a, an, an image, a typical image from one of our videos. This is one of the videos we field tested. This is about uh, income tax issues for farm workers who are on an H-2A visa. It's pretty complicated. There's a lot of numbers. A lot of people in the community aren't even aware that they're that they have an obligation to file taxes in some way. So it's like a complicated issue. We try to make it um, clear through video. But as you can see, this is a PowerPoint slide. I don't, I don't know if that's like, it's an image from our video, but I basically created this whole thing in PowerPoint. The arrow, the like pay stub there, and that drawing, which is in that clip art pack that anybody can use. Um, and like Sart said, the reason we don't do the talking head uh, real person type video is that we can make something in a different language very much more easier. We, you just have to record the audio in English and then have another person, like we use um, qualified or certified interpreters to record our voiceover in another language. So we want them to be able to come in, record it, and then not have to come back, you know? so if we need to make a change. And so that's why we favor this animation style. And so after you get the images, that's the time to record the voiceover. So I'm gonna talk a bit, little bit about the equipment, but um, you know, over the years, like there's, I don't know, I've gotten in a lot of discussions about the quality of the audio. I think doing a few little efforts, getting a, a, a microphone is worth it. But I don't think it's necessary to to like n create the whole sound booth because like I think like it's better to get good visual information with with pretty good audio out there rather than to have perfect audio. Um, so this is the sound setup that I've used on all of our videos pretty much, and it's basically that Blue Yeti. USB microphone and you know I use this sound booth thing that I made out of a plastic bin and egg crate mattress foam on my desk and because like in our office there's copy machines there's people walking by you know and it's just like not an ideal sound environment but that cuts out a lot of the sound I start I think you have like a like an actual sound screen. What is, what is that thing that you use when you record on your desk? Same thing. I've I've got a, a sound screen. Um, uh, it ran a little bit less than a hundred dollars. Um, the biggest improvement definitely came from the Blue Yeti mic. Um, it's USB plug in, and it's about a hundred dollars. Also, uh, just being able to um, remove most of that background noises is a big improvement, though. Also, so for two hundred dollars. That gets you from zero to about uh, 90 percentile for higher quality videos. Your what you're spending on mics after that, you get small incremental increases. But getting rid of that background noise and having a decent mic, uh, most of the people we do webinars with, um, I talk to them and try to encourage them to do better mics because it helps a lot, especially for the archived videos. Yeah. And I I like that concept that you bring that you brought up. I mean that's kind of my larger philosophy on the videos too. Is like do a little bit to get up. You know, it, a little bit can make a big difference, but you don't have to have perfection because um, it's better to get this information out there. Um, editing audio and video together. So our guide covers this. Um, I'll talk a little bit about the software we're using, but first, you know and we've already kind of covered this, but why not use the live actors? I, it's hard to memorize. I think that I've discovered like when you have somebody come in and say, okay, here's our script. Can I'm gonna like have the camera on you, go ahead. Let's say line number one, you know, that's why actors get paid because it's hard to memorize a line and then say it to the camera and ha not have it look, you know, completely strange or wooden. So, you know, adding adding the, the the access issue which is we want to we want to make videos in other languages and 
you know, the camera time is just, it takes a lot of time of production and it's difficult for a lot of people to do it uh, in a way that you're going to be happy with. And I think like having a voice server is just as good. So here's the sort of like demonstrate sort of a visual chart de showing the PowerPoint technique. I mean, like that is basically like the slides of an animation there. Those are keynote slides, PowerPoint slides. And um, the thing that I've been using is the actual animations built in to PowerPoint itself, just like in this presentation today, the zooming in and out and just moving across the screen. A, again, a little bit can go a long way. Just a little bit of showing like, oh, you know, like here's where the document goes. I Like we field tested it and had like feedback from the community that was like, that actually made it really clear because, you know, for example, in this video shot that is on screen right now, this is about like how to protect your Section 8 voucher. Now the voucher program has a lot of paperwork that you're supposed to, that, like if you have a voucher, you're obligated to like give this form to this person and this form to that person. And a lot of people are not used to that and it's confusing and who gets what. And so just having the, the, the players, the characters on screen and have those forms like swooping to the appropriate place we got feedback that that was really effective. Like, oh, I see. You can't just give everything to the, you know, the housing authority. You also have to give a copy to the landlord. So that was all PowerPoint animation, the built-in just like moving or or like move in animations. And so if if you're intimidated about animation at all, it's already built in into PowerPoint or Keynote. So that's that's what this video is that you're watching and most of the videos that we've been using in field testing. We also use Camtasia, which allows us to do that video screen grab. So once you get that PowerPoint presentation with its animations to a point that you like, I mean, you can actually record PowerPoint within the software program itself, but I, I often use Camtasia, so I'm like, I play the PowerPoint presentation and then Camtasia is recording the video screen and it allows me to like add a whole nother layer of animation on top. So Camtasia has these call outs like circles and arrows and zooming in and like, you know, highlighting one portion, but, but blocking out the rest. And when you're showing like a form, so we have a video series that shows our power of attorney forms we can go through and show here's this paragraph and like you know black or gray out the rest and it, that is something that Camtasia is really effective at and also going through websites navigating through like here is a place where you need to go to apply or do the online calculator Camtasia lets you do that so as far as our video production outfit I think Camtasia is pretty essential um, this just again shows like the yeah, two versions. On Camtasia. Um, they've got a, a nonprofit discount. It's a little bit less than $200. Um, software wise, it, it is a very easy to learn piece of software. Um, it's nowhere near as powerful as something like Adobe Creative, um, which is going to be a lot more expensive. Um, but it's much, much easier to use. Very, very simple program. I've had no trouble with um, lawyers or people with absolutely no tech background picking it up very quickly. Yeah, and it's a really good video editing software, you know, and like for the audio part too, it's very clear where the sound waves are and you can drag and drop the various chunks of audio or video or images and I, I mean, if you if you don't have anything else, I'd say get that. Um, this is a demonstration of the one of the videos series that we field tested. It's our power of attorney advanced directive videos, but again, just showing like that's a Camtasia scene right there with like the green and blue circles circling those names, just to try to explain like here that you need to have two witnesses have them sign here while, you know, the notary's there, so. And this is a pretty old <laughs> way of communicating. This is a poster 
this is a poster that advertises one of our field testing sessions. So I, I put a sample there in the guide just so you can see it, but this is our step six. So once you've gotten your draft video, I'm gonna call it, you've got your draft first round video, and you're, and this is where a lot of times we would in, it, formally have just stopped. We'd put it on YouTube and Law Help and just say, well, there's our publication and let's hope it helps. But through this whole experience of field testing, I'm now a firm believer that like it's not complete until you've actually field tested it. So I'm going to go through briefly what that it looks like. And yeah, we started, we contacted senior centers, housing programs. We had you know, an outreach worker in the farm worker community. And basically the, the thing we offered was we can do a legal information outreach, which a lot of people in these places want, you know, and they're usually like, yeah, we need you to come talk to us about power of attorney documents, or we need you to talk about the voucher program. It's super confusing. And, you know, it's like all the forms are in English and all of our residents are in Spanish. Can you please come do a QA? and a Can you please give us legal information? So then, yes, we can. We would also like to show a video on this exact same topic. And we would like to ask the people there, would you be able to give us feedback on the video to see if it's working? Okay. Because we Again, don't know. We've yeah. got a few quick questions from the last um, area. Um, okay. One of them was, um, kid, uh, your PowerPoint templates, that type of stuff, um, is that available? Um, a lot of those are available on sharelawvideo.org. They can be downloaded. There's no login required. We just ask people to fill out a very short um, form letting us know what program they're from using it. Um, but also, um, if any of the videos that you see on Northwest Justice Projects um, YouTube channel, which I'll drop a link to there, um, Daniel, are, are you willing to help people out with kind of an intro of how you put that together or scripts or that type of stuff? Uh, yeah, I mean, definitely you can contact me and I, I mean, I can send you the PowerPoint. I know share a lot of video. We can like post them up there too, but like, I'm mm -hmm. happy to share these images and any techniques too. And then you can see how I created them. Um, and then what's so the real difference? No problem with that. Uh, Camtasia and iMovie, because I know you've got some experience with iMovie also. Yeah. iMovie, you know, Windows Live Movie Maker, you use that a little bit, but mainly I use iMovie on a Mac and then Camtasia. Um, I think more and more Camtasia, I guess. But mm -hmm. So what, what do you get out of Camtasia that you don't really get with iMovie? Is it just the animations? Um, like what... Well, I don't know. I mean, they're pretty comparable, although Camtasia has the video screen grab thing. And so I use that a lot. And it's got some, it's got it, the built in and zooming in and kind of flashing across. iMovie has some, but Camtasia is kind of built more for that. Like it's, it's already conceived of a, like, you're going to be showing like a, a screen and you're manipulating like the space around that two dimensional screen and how do you do that? And Camtasia's like built in animations seem to be more based on that. iMovie is more of a like, you're taking video with your phone of your vacation and you wanna like edit it together. And so here's the kind of defaults we think you'd like on that. But so that's, I don't know if that explains it very well. No, I, I think that does a, does a good job. The The screen capture feature is super easy in Camtasia. Um, I, I do know people for screen capture who also use um, Open Broadcast or XSplit. Um, both of those have screen capture, but it puts the screen capture plus the basic editing and the animation really easy to use into one package. Um, but it's probably the best uh, screen capture um, software out there. Yep. Yeah. Um, uh, were there other questions about the animation part? Um, something on the, um, uh, with regards to marketing um, and trying to get the videos out there, is it worth putting some time into uh, Facebook ads um, to target? Um... Um, 
this is this is a piece we can maybe we should have a like mini discussion at the end of the presentation about promotion and marketing of the videos because i think this is some place that we need to actually improve on and learn from other people if they have any tips like promoting the videos on facebook seems like like yeah obviously yes do it right like facebook ads is like a step further that i don't think our organization is ready for or start unless you know what <laughs> more than i do um, I don't know. Let's, if let's have a discussion about this at the at the end. Um, I, I've been working with another organization that is actually um, doing some field testing on Facebook ads. Uh, but personally, the the outreach and marketing, um, getting a community of people that can share it, that care about kind of your client um, group, uh, matters so much more than than five dollars on Facebook because Facebook really loves uh, people. And sharing content from people and makes um, organizations, including nonprofits, pay to play. If you can get people to share your stuff, it will go so much further than a Facebook ad. Um, you can definitely get some advantages out of that. Yeah, that's a great insight. And, you know, I mean, this, this field testing um, process is, again, where, where I'm coming from, like being a hotline attorney, where I'm talking to hundreds of people a year calling at the emergency level when, you know, maybe they've gotten the eviction notice, oh, my voucher got terminated already, um, or like now, now, I, now I have an overpayment. It's always, you know, when I'm talking to many people in that situation, and that's like an emergency room, I want to go back in time months or a year before and say, let's, let's do some preventative educational legal work here to a room full of people and you know, let people know this is the consequence if you don't do this. It's like, a, this is our process, you know, it may not make sense, but this is what you have to do to avoid this consequence. So I see each of these field tests as having that dual, you know, purpose, which is like, not only are you testing the video and creating that conversation, you're actually like communicating preventative, educational, legal information. So you don't have to do an emergency or maybe it's, it, you know, often on a hotline, it's too late. So I, I'm, I really believe that like taking these videos out into the community and going to a senior, actually going to where people are, showing it to people and being there in person to get feedback on the video itself is, it, it just, it, it changed my whole perspective on what these things are capable of doing. I'm not saying that I think like, oh, videos are the answer forever, but I, like, I think like now it's essential to do that community engagement and community work, which means actually leaving the office and going there. So this, I, I describe it in the guide and this is, I'm just going to, you know, you start with the flyer, you say, here's what we can offer this information. We actually did for these tests offer gift cards to a local grocery store. We ask the people at the community center, like, where would it be the best place um, just to, you know, show people that we value their, their contribution and, you know, making a comfortable, confidential space in that senior center or community center or farm worker residence. That's what we tried to do. Um, I even have a couple canned speeches that if you're going to do one of these things, you can say to like convey that information. So you are the experts, the video is being tested, not you. This just sets it up to let people in the room know that like, oh, this isn't like a, you know, well, we're going to show a video and then, you know, if you don't get it, you're not, you're not, you're not intelligent or, or this video, because we're the lawyers and we're the authority and you need to like hear from us. It's like the whole point is like whether they can understand their legal issue and, and, come to a place that they, you know, a resolution that they want. So we're testing the video. If it, if it doesn't make sense, that's not your fault. That's ours. Like we, we didn't do, we didn't create the right video. So I always start out with that, set up the, set it up so that like everybody knows that like, you know, we're not just making these things for fun. We want them to, to work. And then, of course, the anonymity and confidentiality. So, like, the way we do tests, I don't, like, take people's personal data. I don't, like, write their name down. I, you know, we, we don't, like, connect what they're, gonna, what they're saying with them. And I think you have to, like, convey in that field test that, like, you know, you can speak freely about the video 
but I'm not going to like come back later and say like, you know, you mentioned that and of course it's voluntary. And so I always um, talk about, because we used an audio recorder. We, we didn't do it at first and then we started doing it to make the transcript. And I think it actually really helped a lot, but just explaining to people, this is completely voluntary. If you want to get up and leave, that's totally fine. You can, you can still have the coffee, you can have a donut, like, but like, don't sit here and be uncomfortable. Like, it's up to you. Um, the whole point is we want to make this like a better video for other people in your situation, other seniors, other DV survivors. So those little speeches are in the guide. I think that, you know, obviously you don't have to like say those things, but that's a really good way to explain what we're doing here. And like, I, I got a lot of good, I, I think that people really opened up and gave us much better feedback on our videos after setting it up that way. Um, it looks like there's an audience comment about Facebook. Do you see that, Sart? It... Yes. Um, okay. Over, that Facebook has um, the ability to let you uh, target to particular demographics, which is which is very true. There, that um, yes, it, you have a lot of flexibility um, in where who sees those things through Facebook ads. Strongly agree there. That is very useful, especially from the outreach perspective, if you want a particular group of individuals to see it. Well, and it kind of, uh, honestly, I'm kind of wondering now, and maybe we can, again, talk about it in that promotional discussion later. It, like, I wondered if these things could be done through something like Facebook Live or the video, you know what I mean? Like, a group of people, I don't know, I don't, it'd be a whole another type of situation, but like, because yeah, so much of really like the constraints. One. I, I think that there is some opportunity to do um, kind of streaming testing of videos. Um, I have not done anything in, in that space, uh, but the technology is definitely there. Um, I've done it for like uh, website um, UX testing with people. Um, where I get to see their webcam, they're looking at the site itself. I can also see where their cursor is and what they're doing on the site. Um, so it, um, I've used it in other contexts. I just haven't used it with regards to videos. So I, I think there's definitely some potential there. Yeah. So for now, I mean, like the, what we had done is like actually physically being in the room with people, which I think is like also a vital thing and you can't just I now think we should be doing this with most of our publications our groups were from range from 8 to 20 um, one to one and a half hours after that I think everybody's energy it just you know the talking kind of falters and that's about the 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 logistics of it um, I think doing one field test for each is like essential. Doing more is better until you get that saturation of like, okay, we keep hearing the same comments. I think we got all the information we're going to get. Let's change the video now, like based on um, what we've heard. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about that in just a second. Um, but just this is another just sort of a logistical aid that I, you know, found helpful in my own field test, which is like, here's a checklist of things to bring, you know. And so like it, this is in the guide and you can just like, here's the stuff to bring before you go. So um, HDMI cable to connect to a flat screen TV. It seems like a lot of senior centers and places that we were going um, had a flat screen TV that we could connect our laptop to rather than using a projector. But, you know, we've used projectors as well. Um, so this whole process, and this is where, this is not so like technology tips or anything, but just like, well, what do you do in this discussion? Now, I, I, I am a lawyer, so, and I do talk to a lot of clients, and so I kind of know like, here's what like questions are probably gonna come up. But like, when you open up a discussion and you just showed a video on a power of attorney document or like income tax issues or um, the Section 8 voucher program, you're giving legal information, 
you're going to get a lot of people right away say, well, look, here's my legal issue. Or like, here, I have a question about this. And the answer is something that's going to be like legal information or advice. And we can't give advice in this kind of context. We can only give general information. But even that, it's like, you know, we're not talking about the video. We're talking about this particular, like, legal situation. And so the way I handle that in these field tests is just, just say, first, we're going to talk about this video because we really need to be able to improve it. We're going to talk about stuff about videos, specifically this one, and then in general. And then that's a really good legal question. I'm going to write it down or have my assistant write it down. At the end, we're going to have a Q&A. And we're going to talk about, we're going to try to get to as many of those as we can. And that's, that's kind of how I ended up sort of dividing the session. Um, and so I, I often, I had an assistant who was like a, a, a social worker in our organization. And that was extremely helpful. And I think like when I've researched how to do field tests, there's usually, it's, I mean, it's almost always better to have two people because then somebody can be a facilitator having that empathetic eye contact and talking to people and, and like facilitating the discussion, getting the feedback from the audience and then somebody else is taking notes and then able to like handle the sort of like as people come in, you know, or as people need to leave. Um, and I, ha I have some sample questions at the end. Also in the guide, I'm going to show you, but basically it starts out um, generally, you know, like how many people use YouTube? How, how many people like uh, go and watch videos on their phone? Has anybody ever like tried to find the answer to a legal question by going on the internet? You know, I mean like an all starting there, then going to like, this video you just watched, does anybody have any questions about it? Are there terms you still don't understand? D you know, did it annoy you? Like, do you hate the cartoons? I like, I got into a really honest discussions with people to find out like, what what is this stuff that we're doing? And does it even, is it worthwhile? And should we do more and what kind? Um, you know, uh, the analysis of the feedback afterwards is where you really get, um, start to use all parts of your brain, I think. And like, this is where I think that recording it with audio, I'm gonna show you the like particular audio recorder that we used in just a second, but I actually sat down and made transcripts. I can type, you know, pretty quickly. It's okay for me to make a transcript. So this actually, I think is a very a productive use of a few hours because you know, I was there, we took notes, but like until you actually like sit down and listen to an, an hour recording of like a group of seniors or, or DV survivors talking about the video, you, you can see so many more patterns if you write it down. So I don't know if you like, maybe start, you have some ideas about transcription software or something. I know there exists, but like I just did it kind of like old fashioned way of like stop, and this is where I use a video editing software too to stop the audio, type it down, and then play it again. Do you, do you know any software transcription? Uh, so I just did a session at Equal Justice Works um, mm -hmm. or, or EJ Equal Justice Conference. Um, one of my fifty tech tips was a application called Otter um, that it does uh, voice transcription, and it specializes in noticing multiple speakers. Um, so it, you can run it during a meeting, during a session, um, and it will um, attempt to give you what it thinks by listening to people, who's talking and what they're saying. And then you've got a starting transcript to go back and clean up. Um, and it is so much easier to use a slightly jarbled, like not perfect transcript than starting from scratch. So Otter is the name of the application. I strongly recommend it. And, you know, I mean, we got bad feedback. I mean, not we had feedback that like critiqued our videos, I should say, not bad feedback, but like feedback that said, you guys are not, you know, that doesn't make sense. I'm still confused. Like, what? Like, what are you talking about? Like, and I love hearing that because, wow, I'm glad we are hearing it now because otherwise we just put this thing on YouTube and say, well, I guess that that solves our our 
educational problem there. But like hear people say like, you know, you keep saying caseworker and especially when we're talking like through an interpreter, an interpreted video, like through Spanish, we had like a Spanish speaking audience and they're saying like, you're using this word to describe like what I'm supposed to do. I'm supposed to go to the housing authority and like explain something to them, but I don't know who that person is. Is it a, a social worker? Wow. Okay. So we went back and changed you know, with the help of our interpreter and our translator, like what, how do we call this person? Because it's, we're totally not doing a good job with our first round. So that's something where like, I, I feel like we kind of like maybe saved this video from like being completely useless. <laughs> I mean, I mean, that's like extreme, but like we heard a lot of stuff like that. Other okay. times we heard like, you know what, this actually made a lot of sense. Now I kind of get it. And again, people who are, who told us over and over, like, I'm a visual learner, like, thank you so much. Like, can you please make more of this? Can you make a video about topic X, Y, Z? We heard that a lot in our field tests. Yeah, And, and so then we changed the video. We, we have tried putting surveys on the end of videos. No, nobody watches it. Nobody fills out the surveys. We've tried asking for feedback other ways. Um, this is by far, it has, gives us a lot of information that other traditional ways of uh, trying to get feedback have just failed comparatively. Yeah, I, don't, I mean, once you get into the disclaimer and stuff at the end and credits, I don't think people are going to get to that survey. I mean, like, I know that we could do more of like at the beginning, like, hey, if you have comments, please, like, you know, in the let us know in the in below, like YouTube videos do. But we haven't had that. We haven't made that leap. Um, but just a lot of the stuff that we found from getting our feedback, I mean, basically, <laughs> there's like kind of like four main groups. There's like these gaps where it's like somebody is like, hey, I have a question. And, you know, you didn't talk about it at all in the video. And you should have, because there it is, somebody's asking it, right? It's a basic legal question. And so uh, that a piece of information that you just left out, because when you and the other attorneys wrote it, it seemed like that was complete and you, you need to put it in. Or like, you know, like you think you're explaining it really well. Like here's what the word durable means when we're talking about a durable power of attorney document. That's why it's important to have it on the, you know, and we have this explanation about it and we put it on the screen and then right away, like five people afterwards are asking like, what, what does durable mean? Okay, the video didn't do its job, right? So then that's like a mishap where you need to like either like change the animation or like explain it differently. Maybe you need to like use primacy or emphasis repeated or put it at the front and there's various ways you can change it to like you know correct that that misinformation that you're giving right of course cult cultural context you know like when people explain like you had no idea but like when they're saying like you know what there's we're not going to go talk to the housing authority because we're afraid of what they're going to do to us it's like oh you know we made this video thinking like here's the the best way to convey the information we didn't even account for this huge actual real emotional response to what we're saying that's how we need to kind of re like retrof at this whole thing and then of course there's direct recommendations like i can't read that lettering on that or that font like oh okay that's an access issue we need to make those change that's pretty easy to make right so so we did in we our did guide we have here. just sort of i um, Go ahead. Uh, comments include like um, make sure to like motivate, compensate uh, individuals, gift cards, something like that is is definitely a good idea as part of it. Um, also, anything you can do to make it fun or interactive, um, asking questions, quizzes, that type of stuff um, is definitely useful. Also, because if you're going to be working with people for an hour, um, having some different activities or different ways to do it is helpful. Oh yeah, I want to learn more about this Kahoot or Menti that somebody brought up. Um, so the recommended software sheet I, I presented at the end of the guide. It's just and you know this will probably be obsolete in a year or two. And we'll have to change it, which is fine. But I, just a couple things that helped us or helped me through this whole project was the Explainer Academy, which is. Common Craft has a lot of awesome videos, which probably a lot of you know about. There's a couple classes on there about how to explain, how to make instructional videos, 
take information that like you, makes a lot of sense to you, but you have that curse of knowledge where you forget what it's like to not know that thing that you've studied for years. Like that's what lawyers are afflicted with a lot. So getting it down into a minute, you know, understanding where your audience is. I learned a lot through that explanation master course and the media maker course is like, it goes even further to talk about that step-by-step -step animation using PowerPoint's own animations. And so that's a recommendation. I'd also say reaching your readers, which we already covered at the, that's where we started. But again, like it's, they've done a lot of good work. And I think that's a, a guide that's essential if you're gonna try to do anything like this. But another one is this fifth edition, maybe they'll come out with another one soon, called Focus Groups, a Practical Guide for Applied Research. And this is kind of more advanced and it's not talking about legal services organizations necessarily, but it is talking about in the community and and getting feedback from and you know focus groups sometimes has a negative connotation to some people but basically it's like asking people if it actually helps and and then how to analyze those transcripts how to like see those patterns and it has a lot of logistical tips too that i learned from like you can't go really much longer than an hour and a half hour and a half like the a group of people is just not going to be able to like pay attention and probably you won't either as the facilitator. And this is just sort of a, a sample spreadsheet. I mean, like this is a, a, a package that could get you like to making like all the videos that we've made, that, that's how much it would cost, you know, and probably you already have a computer in your office, but that's sort of a, that would be a, a, a good video suite, production suite, I think. Mm -hmm. I don't know. If, sorry, you have anything to add to this? No, I, I strongly, strongly agree. Um, the the computer price might seem a little high to people initially, but when you're doing video production, your choke point is going to be a, your computer, and kind of the af, off the rack computer that you're buying for advocates will not work. Their computer will shut down. It will be unusable for hours at a time. It's well worth getting a decent custom. Um, computer that has a good video card to it um, to do uh, video editing, uh, recording, that type of stuff. Uh, microphone, we definitely already talked about. Um, I, I recommend instead of um, speakers over your um, headphones that give you a little bit higher quality, um, but about $150 uh, after that, you're uh, diminishing returns for anything else from it. Um, but this this can easily get you there. The Explainer Academy is really the best training that's out there. Um, if you have somebody who really wants to learn about this, that's a great way to do it. And the speakers are, in this context, I was using them sometimes in the field test if we oh, needed to use a projector. Sense. But using a flat screen TV with its own audio system, like then that's that's better than the computer speakers. And I, I this audio recorder, this Tascam DR5, I forgot to show a picture of it. Um, it's on the guide itself. Let me see if I can, there it is um, on the left. That little mini recorder is pretty powerful. I'd have it up front, like next to the computer. Of course I'd tell people like, you know, we're recording this, but I'm not, I don't know your name, so I'm not gonna like, match it up i just just to get do a better job of remembering what you're saying i'm recording this audio does anybody have any objections to that nobody ever did and i would leave it up there and i could pretty much record most of the voices in a, in like a room of 20 people with people coming in and out and shuffling papers and eating so i i don't know that's a pretty amazing recorder i think and it like just connects with a usb to your computer um so, you know, part of our grant, we were going to come up with a viewability instrument, which is sort of a checklist, just like, again, for people who have like, I don't know, never really done the thought about how do I analyze one of these videos or do the field tests. I based it on this um, readability instrument from Transcend, which is a really good way to like analyze your printed materials. It talks about everything from serif fonts to, uh, you know, he headings and subheadings. And so at the end of our guide, we have this, um, it's kind of two checklists really. On the left, it's like 
once you made your first draft of video or your script even like kind of go through and say here's just like basic principles of you know plain information video uh, techniques and i mean using large font making it readable making it accessible you know make sure the videos are not distracting but actually help tell the story or the or the information and that's on the left and then sample questions i mean really if you could do worse if you're going to do your very first field test than just asking these exact questions when you're in a group of people like after you show the video you just say so um did it go by too fast or was it just right were there you know and so there's the questions that you can use you could use this actual guide in the field test do you know where to look next would you share this video with a friend you know how would you share it would you share it through whatsapp would you give them a link all of those things can give you a wealth of information that you didn't have before when you just put it out there on youtube in your office like going out and asking people i think that's the basically the whole point of this project and i'm convinced ever like more than ever that like it's essential to make sure that there's like a, a conversational engagement between your client communities and your legal services organization. So these things aren't just like out there doing, you know, making you feel good because you made them, but like they're not really helping. Um, so the guide again is available to download. Hopefully you'll be able to update it as needed. Um, sorry, I wanted to leave like some room for a discussion because it sounded like there was a lot of ideas about promotion and marketing and i kind of wanted to hear about that too um i can talk about anything else though that we already covered because i think there's plenty of time left mm -hmm. yeah if, if anybody's got questions please uh, feel free to post those um from my personal experience on youtube um i i think that it is extremely important to ask people questions at the end of a video and ask for feedback directly. Um, that is not something that um, our program has been uh, comfortable with at this point, um, mostly because of um, the staffing issues around responding to comments, that type of stuff. But in, with other organizations that I've worked with and on personal projects, the YouTube community is very, very, very willing to give you lots of feedback. And that is a, it's a really good way um, to get people invested in your channel overall. And once people start commenting on the things that you're doing, they are more likely to see your future videos, to share them. Creating that interactive community helps with marketing a lot. A lot of the hits that I've seen other channels get are from their kind of super fans people who were helped by something that they had who share that with their community on facebook or somewhere else yeah i think that's a i mean a great point and and you're right like we haven't it's almost like this place we just haven't gone yet at, at our organization but we i would i, I think it's going to be if we ever do i a, a breakthrough because if, if once we develop the time and staffing to have people to, to do that engagement, right? Because it takes time and, and intelligent energy to like, okay, moderate the discussion, but also respond to it. And I think there's just so much valuable potential there to get ideas from people about how these things are working. And we haven't, we haven't done it yet. So, but I also like really, find value in the in-person interaction as well and we've continued to do some of that because we do community outreach and we go to places and say like here's here's some information about landlord tenant law you know general tips to avoid the emergency la later and i am i'm always kind of, you know i have asked on continued the sort of field test thing like would you would you find this information more helpful if we made a video about it and like a lot of positive yes that would be great because like i like you know you present this like print thing to me and like it's just not helping me because i can't get through the like the three pages and so like that's just a reality for a lot of people so um 
yeah, and, and you're right there. There is a there is a staffing time issue. Um, if people comment on your videos, um, you need someone who is there uh, in order to hide things that might be disclosing too much personal information um, and to respond uh, quickly so that they uh, stay involved and engaged. So adding that level of asking is a, it is a different time commitment um, entirely. Um, so quickly, what was the, what was the most resp uh, surprising response um, that you got from somebody out of the focus groups? The surpri most surprising response? Yeah. Um, well, I think I covered some of them. I mean, like, you know, our, our video about the Section 8 voucher, it was surprising to hear, like, how the whole concept of where we were trying to explain that you have to report information to the how to your caseworker at the housing authority which to us lawyers seemed to make like perfect sense it was just kind of like that a lot of people were not aware of like where is the housing authority is it a person is it a building how do you go there like who are we talking about i don't want to go there and it's like there's some like larger issues going on that we needed to ad address so that was like surprising in that like oh wow we, like we kind of missed the mark when we made our first round of this video um talking to the farm worker community and finding out that like you know we did a couple tests with in that community and you know finding out that like youtube is not a place to like go get at least in the 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 groups that we talk to that's not a good place to like go get legal information but if if a video was like made and like said here's a video and shared through whatsapp then people would be like yeah i'd share this with a friend because a lot of we need to know this so there's that sort of like how do people access information and the internet and videos in general that was kind of surprising um and i think with the power of attorney documents and the advanced directives i think those were just like i don't know kind of playing pretty well and like they're they're a little different because they walk through a form like they have this is the actual form and that's where we use temptation like here's what this says here's what this says and i i mean it wasn't necessarily surprising but it was nice to know that like people really thought that was a good use of a video and like because they could stop and start and a lot of these senior centers had computer centers or like a couple computers to use and so people were like yeah this is great because i can i can re-watch it over here on these computers no i, I think um, that's a really interesting i don't know one, that, that ability to share it via WhatsApp or on a, the finding out how client communities are using technology uh, is just really, really important because we want to stay as, as relevant and we want to go to them. So I'm, one of the big mistakes that LSNPAP made before um, we, uh, before I took over the program was we tried to keep everything um, in our own place and didn't make it really easy to share and putting it out there for our community on YouTube meant that the, the views went way up and it was much easier to share and much easier to see on a mobile. But figuring out what a particular client community, what technology they're using, um, in some cases, it makes much more sense to publish things um, on as a Facebook video or than it does um, on YouTube. Like figure out where you need to go in order to share these things online for them to be successful. yeah and i mean like i don't know over the years like because i use these animations like i've had a lot of feedback mostly from attorneys or where people are like you know what these things look kind of cartoony and they they they're not really serious and or things like that right like have you ever asked people with whether they like this or not you know and like now i did and like I never had anybody say this is demeaning or these cartoons are like not i mean i had feedback like we know that this is serious like but these cart the animations are fine like we don't need an actual a lawyer's head talking 
you know, to convey like, oh, this is legal, the legal authority telling us what's what. So, I mean, I guess that was kind of surprising too. Mm -hmm. No, I, I, uh, I've definitely run into that also that um, there, there is a tendency to generalize um, what one thinks is good versus what one believes that it will be good for a client and getting the, the client's feedback instead of a, a lawyer's feedback is so essential. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we, we worked on a, a project recently from a, um, from a class that had uh, done a full year um, uh, kind of capstone project. Um, and one of their big problems was all of their user testing uh, was students and lawyers in the legal aid um, office. They didn't actually reach out to clients. So it was very difficult to evaluate uh, their project at the end because all of the surveys were all internal. It's more work to go out to clients, but you're going to get a whole different perspective that is just essential. Um, yeah. So there was a question here. Um, are you using analytics to see which methods work best, like uh, heat maps or um, where users spend most time on pages? Um, I've, I've done that for website testing. Um, I haven't uh, seen that used in the video space, but in, the, in videos, YouTube gives you incredible analytics when people enter, what areas they might be bookmarking and sharing, and when people drop off. So the internal YouTube analytics, we can see that if we put a graphic up there that happens to be terrible or too many words or something else, that that user engagement just drops and we start losing people. So the analytics from YouTube are great. Um, with regard to focus grouping, though, I'm, I haven't, I've seen that done in the web design space, but I haven't used that in the video space. Uh, how about you, Daniel? I mean, I haven't, I, I look at those analytics sometime and kind of, it's, it, I mean, it's an amazing trove of data, but like I haven't used it as much as possible to like, okay, now we should like change our promotional techniques or like how, what the content even. And I think that's, I, I guess just a staffing and time issue because I have, you know, like as soon as this grant ended, I went into a, a, like a, a, a training program where I'm like full-time attorney right now. I'm not doing anything on the like informational outreach except, you know, going to a community and doing an outreach as part of being an attorney. But like now I'm just doing legal work. So I don't have the time in this particular six months to do the stuff that I would want to do on that to make it really worthwhile. I mean, like, but yeah, ideally we could have like a, we could make these videos very quickly, a lot of them, a lot of short videos, I think, right? Like much like travel videos or cooking videos that you see on YouTube, right? Or that I watch, right? Like a, a new entry, like every few days or every week, right? With one little bit of information or like, and connect it in a, sort of a larger narrative of like, here's a, here's a Northwest Justice Project's you know, legal informational video channel, please make comments below. And I think if mm -hmm. we got to that point, like we would be using those analytics a lot more, right? Mm -hmm. Sorry, I mean, wouldn't you say? Oh, I, I, I definitely agree. Um, and the potential outreach to clients um, and helping those individuals that aren't able to make a call during the nine to five of our hotline or uh, reaching them on the weekends or other times is just incredible. Um, currently, we've had the channel up for a few years now, and we're a little bit over 127,000 uh, views on Northwest Justice Projects, um, and that's just with some uh, part-time um, staff towards it. Uh, but if, if you really viewed this as um, a direct form of client services that had kind of the full-time staff, strategic plan, analytics, feedback as part of it, um, I, I think you could easily... Um, be up to that every few months, not every few years. You could be um, having yeah. a significant number of people viewing those all the time. Uh, because Yeah, and then you'd have, be able to use those analytics and say, okay, we're getting so many people watching this in this county or region, in this area, this, you know, in this city. Why? You know, find out why, like, or, okay, this just, this concludes the debate 
everybody's using their phones and nobody's looking on computers or that's how, what analytics might be able to tell you, right? Mm -hmm. Like, Definitely. which I think we're kind of like getting there. Like, I think people are using more mobile to like access our site, but we don't, you know, like if we had that more active engagement, like that would be valuable. And it would just, I think, you know, I can, I just kind of have this sense through the, the like minimal efforts that we have made in using those that like there's a lot of information there that we could use and we just haven't gotten there yet. Yep, definitely. Okay. Um, it, any, any last questions before we wrap things up here? That doesn't look like it. Um, the handouts are available uh, for download. Um, if you've got any future questions, please feel free to ask us. Um, uh, a lot of the resources are available over on sharelawvideo.org. I'm putting another link in the chat uh, to that. Um, we are doing another video related uh, training that's gonna be um, more like about a half an hour with some open discussion afterwards um, coming up here. It is just 20 quick tips. It's gonna be one slide per tip, a URL, um, somewhere where you can uh, find out a better way to do thumbnails or um, useful software that makes this stuff easy to do on an iPhone, that type of stuff. Um, and that one is coming up. Uh, let me double check the date on it. It is um june 20th so we're going to go over the share law video website a little bit make sure people are familiar with it that it's easy for people to give us feedback if there's any ways to improve it and then 20 quick tips um, on making videos um i i will mention these guides but they're going to be separate things from what we really went over here for the last hour so if you're interested in that uh, please register uh, thank you so much, Daniel. Greatly appreciate having you um, here to share this with the community. And please feel free to reach out to either myself or Daniel with any questions related to video production. Uh, between us, we've done hundreds of YouTube videos at this point and would love to get more engagement in this online format for our client communities.